Hello and welcome to The Nurse Station. I'm Rhea Mobley and today we're going to learn about bow tie questions. As promised in my last video, I'm going to continue to present different styles of questions seen on the next gen NCLEX and not just present them because of course I want you to know what you're going to potentially see, how to break down these style of questions, but also how they're scored. So if you didn't see my previous video, you'll be able to see the three scoring models the next gen NCLEX uses. But bow ties questions specifically use this scoring model. So what I want you to understand, first off, I think it looks like a bow tie, right? That's why it's called a bow tie. But the maximum amount of points you can get for this question is five. So I want you to think of each box as a different token. And for each box, if you get an incorrect answer, you get zero points. If you get a correct answer, one point. Correct answer, one point, and so on. So you have the potential, because there's five different tokens, to get up to five points. That's your maximum score. Your lowest score is zero points if you don't get any of the conditions or parameters to monitor or actions to take correct. So we'll briefly um, just kind of, again, show you the scoring and then we'll practice, okay? So I want you to think, uh, in this question, they're going to present you with a patient scenario, right? And of course, they are trying to better assess clinical judgment. So you might be um, sifting through tabs in an EMR, electronic medical record. For instance, you might have to look at vital signs and the nurse's notes. You're presented with a scenario and based upon that scenario, right, don't we always hone in on abnormal cues because the abnormals are trying to show you your problem, right? So based upon the scenario they give you, you are going to pick the condition you most likely think the patient is experiencing. Based upon that condition, your, your hypothesis, you're gonna state the actions that you would take. And remember, according to our nursing process, we don't just take actions, we also evaluate if our actions worked. So based upon the scenario, you're going to hypothesize what you think the condition the patient is most likely experiencing. Based upon that condition, you are going to pick appropriate actions to take. And then, based upon the actions you take, what parameters are you going to monitor? Meaning, how will you evaluate if the actions worked? Okay, so I'll give you an example. So you saw your scenario, you picked the condition, and you actually picked the correct condition. So it's going to be like in a drop down. Now, I don't even want to say drop down box, but picture these as four different conditions in different boxes and you say hey based upon this scenario I think that's the condition based upon this condition I would take as a nurse this action and let's say you picked this other action to fill your action to take boxes but it was wrong and then based upon your actions you decided to observe or continue to monitor this parameter and you chose this parameter but again that was wrong Remember, five separate tokens. So all together, if you picked these answer choices, you would get a total of three points for this question, right? You picked the right condition they were most likely experiencing. You only picked one correct action to take, and you only picked one parameter to monitor. So your total points for that question would be three. Now let's practice with the actual scenario. So I want y'all to... Do whatever you need to do, pause the video. I really want you to take a look at the scenario on your own, okay? What I want you to do, read the question. I want you to pretend that these are tabs, right? That you would click in your electronic medical record. So look at the vital signs, look at the output. And based upon that, I always start with what are they most likely experiencing? Remember, hone in on abnormal cues from um, the scenario, the data, you have to sift through the information that NCLEX is providing to you. Start with what condition do you most likely think they're experiencing? What actions would you take based upon that condition? And then what parameters would you need to monitor? So again, pause the video, take a time or take a moment to do that. All right. So I always, always tell my students, you need to hone in on the abnormal data. The abnormal data is trying to show you your priorities. It's trying to show you your potential problems. So the nurse is caring for a one-day post-operative colectomy patient. So remember, that's removal of a part of the colon. 
Upon obtaining vital signs and output, the nurse notes the client is more tired than usual. So that is a change, right? Always think sometimes uh, changes or the start of somebody declining is just a slight change in behavior. So that is a change, more tired than usual. Let's look at the information provided to you. With your vital signs, you should have honed in on the elevated heart rate, the lower blood pressure, and yes, we are starting, the respiratory rate is starting to increase. But I always really want you, when you prioritize data, think about what can I actually do about it? We can't really do anything quite yet about this respiratory rate. Remember, 12 to 20 is your normal respiratory rate. When it gets severely elevated, we might need to take measures to bring the respiratory rate back down, but not necessarily for this. But we are seeing the heart rate starting to go up and a blood pressure starting to go down. Now let's look at our output. So over eight hours, 2200 to 0600, they had a good output. Remember, all you need is 30 mLs of urine per hour to show that we have good uh, appropriate, I don't want to say good, but appropriate kidney function. And they have more than enough here. But look, the next eight hours from 0600 to 1400, there has been a decline. Not even a decline, it is almost less than half of what they had the first eight hours or the previous eight hours. Mind you, always think about information you can act upon. This is still meeting 30 ml per hour, because think, this is over an eight hour period, so 30 times eight is 240 mLs over the eight hour period. So technically they're still meeting their urine requirements, but you always have to pay attention to trends and patterns. The urine output is starting to decrease. That's what you need to take away from that. Now look at the JP drain. A JP drain, of course, can be placed after surgery. And we are looking this first eight hour, and I don't want to say first eight hour because we, you know, the initial, the eight hour prior to right now, they had 80 mLs per hour of output. And excuse me, I shouldn't even said per hour. I want you to think 80 mLs over the course of eight hours. Okay, that's how much they had. And same here. I apologize. I should not have said per hour. It is... They had 860 mLs of urine out over this eight-hour period. Then they had 420 mLs of urine out over this eight-hour period. Now, that initial eight-hour period, when they had higher urine output, they only had 880 out from their JP drain. Now, look, the next eight-hour period, my goodness, this is highly, highly concerning. Remember, when it comes to drains, what do we not like? We never like a sudden stop because that can mean the drain is occluded or obstructed. We never like a dramatic increase. And this is a dramatic increase in output. And remember, we don't like the change in color or smell with output, but we don't have that information. So based upon this data, in my mind, for this one day postoperative client, they are now having too much output from their drain. So potentially maybe hemorrhaging. Um, either way, the increased output from the drain could be resulting in a higher heart rate and a lower blood pressure. And then I'm thinking in my mind, fluid volume deficit. That's what I would go with because when you're in fluid volume deficit, doesn't your body try to hold on to whatever fluid it can? Potentially the reason why the urine output is decreasing. So again, that's just a hypothesis. So based upon this, I, again, I want you to think these are all in boxes and you have to select the condition you most likely think the patient is experiencing. So I would pick fluid volume deficit as the condition I think they're most likely experiencing. Based upon this condition, what would you do? Fluid volume deficit, the number one thing, if you can stop the trigger, stop it. If you see active bleed, put pressure, hold pressure, right? But also think we need to replace volume. So based upon these things, let's, let's, let's do process of elimination. I have to have some type of access to be able to administer fluid. So I'm going to definitely insert a peripheral IV and I want to think replace volume. That's what I would do. So obtain a stat EKG or ECG. Do you see anything related to abnormal heart rhythm? Yes, it's tachycardia, but we have no more information about is it regular, irregular, right? Um, we did auscultate. We didn't palpate. There's no evidence in this data. 
So hold on to it, but I'm not saying that would be my priority for fluid volume deficit. Nowhere does it show you any type of, I need to get or uh, a urine culture. I'm thinking infection when I'm thinking urine cultures, specifically UTI. You don't even have an elevated temperature, so it's not really showing you that, so I wouldn't take that. People get distracted by oxygen. They're 96% on room air. So if they have continued fluid volume deficit, we absolutely know when we have decreased blood circulating in our body, it can affect our pulse oximetry level, but we're not to that point. And the other big thing about this is saying now I'm a breather. This patient does not meet high oxygen flow requirements. Really, they're still doing okay on room air. So that's a distractor. Don't pick that. Request an order for 0.9% sodium chloride. This is when pharmacology is so important. If you don't know what this is, you might not pick it. 0.9% sodium chloride is just normal saline, right? Normal saline, lactated ringer, aren't those our fluids that most closely mimic our, our own body fluid? So this is a great option. I would actually have taken this one and this one. Now, I think the problem is they're losing too much volume through their drain. So now they're starting to have uh, other resulting symptoms of fluid volume deficit. So I want to intervene by replacing fluid. And let's think about once we replace fluid, what parameters will show us that we're doing well, that the actions we took are doing great. So of course, if we start replacing volume, their blood pressure should start to increase and hopefully their heart rate should start to come down because the heart doesn't have to pump so hard to try to cope and circulate more volume. So I would absolutely monitor heart rate and blood pressure. Blood glucose is, we don't see any evidence of hyper or hypoglycemia. The temperature is normal, so we're not going to monitor that. And then peripheral edema. You might be thinking volume, but if we're assessing peripheral edema, we're thinking fluid volume overload. So that's a good distractor. But I would also monitor output, right? Don't we want to see urine start to increase if fluid and volume is being replaced? And hopefully the drain output would start to decrease if we can figure out what is causing it to increase. So those would be the priority parameters I would monitor. And if all of these answer choices were correct, look, think of each one as a separate token. One, two, three, four, five, my maximum point would be five. Let's say I got distracted because I was thinking fluid volume deficit, but of course edema is related to fluid in general, and I picked this answer choice. So instead of getting a total of five points because I picked one incorrect answer for my parameter to monitor, you would then have a total of four points. So that's kind of how the bow tie questioning looks. Again, I want you to think I'm going to see a patient scenario of some kind, and I'm going to be sifting through whatever the data the next gen NCLEX is going to provide me, and I'm going to focus on abnormal cues because my priority is to hy hypothesize first what condition are they most likely experiencing. So that's the strategy I want you to use hypothesize first, based upon my data, this is what I think they're most likely experiencing. Then look and see, do you have two appropriate actions based upon the condition you think it was? A big red flag, if you pick this condition, but you don't see any appropriate actions, you may have hypothesized the wrong condition. So look at your scenario again. But I picked this condition, I found two good actions, and then based upon my actions, I'm going to try to identify two parameters that I would need to monitor to evaluate if my actions worked. So I hope this helps y'all. Um, again, I don't want you to be anxious and nervous about the next gen NCLEX. I want you to be confident. You will do great things for patients one day. You just got to get past that test. So um, I hope this t helps you not only identify how to take this question, but also understand how it's scored. Okay. So as always, we are better together. If this helped you, please help another nursing student or nurse. Take care.